welcome to episode 5 of Dielectric Videos. Now today I'm going to be showing you how to use a breadboard. A breadboard is a convenient tool that allows you to rapidly prototype circuits by plugging different components into the holes without having to solder anything together or do anything inconvenient uh, as far as getting the components connected together. Now to demonstrate how a breadboard works, I'm going to be showing you how to use a 555 A-stable timer circuit. Now, if you're interested just in how to put stuff together on the breadboard, you can skip ahead in my video to the point at which I just start talking about this. But just so that you understand what's going on when I build this 555, I'm going to do a brief overview of the function of an A-stable 555 circuit. So here goes. The 555 is essentially kind of a uh, comparator slash flip-flop slash uh, timing system all built into one package. Pins 1 and 8 are the power pins, your ground pin and your high, or voltage high rail pin. And the rest of the pins have to do with the control of the timing and of the chip's output state. Number 3 is the output, which can either be lo uh, logic high or logic low, meaning a voltage close to the upper rail or a vol voltage close to the lower rail, respectively. And it's controlled by the state of the trigger and the threshold pin. There's also a voltage control pin, but that's just going to be connected normally to a capacitor to stabilize the internals of the chip. I won't get into why this needs to be here, but I will tell you the capacitor is usually optional for testing. You only really need it for the field if you want your chip to be very stable. So as to the other pins and their functions, the uh, threshold pin and the trigger pin work in conjunction to control the output. Now, if the trigger pin and the threshold pin are set low, the output is going to be high, and that's the default state for the A-stable 555 circuit. If the trigger pin pulls high and the threshold pin pulls high, the output is then going to pin, uh, pull low. And in the event that the threshold and trigger pins are low and the output is high, pin number 7, which is the discharge pin, is going to be set as open, meaning that it's not going to conduct any current in either direction. But when these pins are detected as high, the pin number seven is going to be uh, a closed circuit to ground, meaning it'll ground out whatever is connected to it. So in this uh, application of the circuit, what I'll show you is how the pins on this correspond to the functions on this circuit. Notice I've changed the order to make the circuit a bit more clear to understand. Now, as you'd expect, eight and one are connected to their respective uh, voltage and ground rails. Pin number four, which is the reset pin, and I didn't discuss that yet, but the reset pin basically, when it pulls low, tells the chip to go back to its default state. Normally for the A-stable 555, the reset pin would be constantly pulled high so that it never resets. So that's, those are both connected to the high. Uh, pin three is the output, which for this circuit, we're going to have connected to an LED via a current limiting resistor, and that's just going to blink on and off when the circuit operates. Uh, we have the optional 10 nanofarad uh, capacitor, which really can be almost any value really uh, to ground. And of course, we have our timing controls. Now, the whole point of this circuit is to time uh, a certain amount of time and have it cycle on and off over and over and over again. And for this particular application with these uh, values of resistor and capacitor, I've chosen roughly a 4.8 hertz signal with 67% duty cycle. This means it flips on and off 4.8 times every second, and it stays on for 67% of the time, meaning it stays off for about 33% of the time. And this should just make a nice kind of blinking light that really doesn't do much else other than blink. Now the way that the timing system works in this is that essentially you're charging and discharging this capacitor. So when this capacitor starts out, it's discharged because essentially there was no power on it, and by default, when it first starts out, these are low, meaning that the output on pin three is going to be high and the light's going to be on. Now, because this is uh, set high, uh, or rather, because this is low and this is set high, pin number seven is set to open, meaning it doesn't conduct any current. So voltage from the high side is free to flow first through this resistor and then through that resistor until it gets to the capacitor and starts charging it. Now, the capacitor by default is gonna be uh, empty, quote unquote empty, it's discharged and it doesn't have a potential across it. As this starts to charge, the potential gradually rises. 
until it reaches about two thirds of the input voltage, at which point pins six and two, which are the trigger and threshold, start to see it as a high input. Now when that happens, they trigger pin number three to turn off to go low, and they, tri uh, they uh, trigger pin number seven to switch from its default state of open to a closed state where it's grounded to the earth or to the ground. Now when this is uh, grounded out, it starts discharging this capacitor back through this resistor. Now this resistor also continuously conducts current into pin seven, but that doesn't really do anything because pin seven is set as a hard low. So this resistor is not doing anything actively, uh, or it is, this resistor is not contributing anything to the capacitor. So as the capacitor drains through this uh, other resistor, it gradually decreases until it hits about one third of the input voltage, at which point these register it as a low, turn the LED back on and start the process over. Now you can obviously control the rate at which the capacitor fills and empties based on these resistors. Now you can only get down to a minimum of a 50% duty cycle. Uh, otherwise, if you want the inverse where you want a very low duty cycle, you'll have to use a, uh, an inverter gate or a transistor. I'll get into that in a, a future video perhaps. But overall, this is just a basic uh, on-off oscillation circuit. It's meant to turn on and off indefinitely when it has power. So in the next video, I'm going to, or the next part of this video rather, I'm going to show you how to build one on this breadboard. And of course, how to use the breadboard is the main point of this video. All right, so now that I've shown you the theory behind the uh, A-Stable 555 timer circuit, now I'm going to show you how to build it on a breadboard. So a few things I should show about how this breadboard actually functions. So essentially you have a gutter running down the middle separating the two sides of it. Now each set of these horizontal holes running along from one side to the other is uh, essentially a rail, a little rail connected together. So if I were to plug in, for example, the 555, which is this little chip here, I'll arbitrarily plug it into this socket uh, here. Each of these pins is going to share continuity with that entire row of, uh, of holes. However, those rows are not at all connected to these side rails. These are the power rails. And as the little line denotes, everything on each side of this is connected together. So all of these are connected together and all of the ones next to them are connected together. That's so you can provide power to different parts on your breadboard all at once. So one thing to keep in mind is to keep track of your pins, you usually want to have the little notch in the chip, which I will try to get the camera to focus. Here we go. You want this little notch at the top towards the top of your breadboard. It allows you to orient the uh, position of your chip however you, uh, it allows you to basically tell what the pins are. Now, it really doesn't matter which way around you use the breadboard. Uh, it does have the lettering on this side and that side, uh, basically the other way around uh, and the numbering the other way around, but it really doesn't matter which position you use so long as you know which side is associated with the little notch on the top of the chip. So, focusing back in here, now, I'm gonna show you essentially how to build this circuit from this diagram. Now, the first thing you always wanna do is uh, get your power ready. You don't wanna actually connect your power until you've finished the way you want your circuit to be designed. That way you don't accidentally short parts out. But to just prepare it, you can plug a wire, a jumper lead into the plus, which is this hole, and another jumper lead into the minus. Traditionally, red is used for positive and black is used for negative. Once again, the electrons don't care what color it is, it's just for your own reference. Now I'm gonna use some alligator clips like this to connect to my power source, which is a really poorly soldered, cruddy looking device that I built my freshman year in high school. I really didn't intend for this to be used in the long term, it just ended up lasting long enough that I'm still using it today. Essentially, it provides five volts, 12 volts, and an unregulated 20 volt tap off of this doorbell transformer. But because it runs through these linear regulators, the voltages are pretty stable and it's good enough for most applications. So I'm not actually going to connect the red to the uh, red wire yet because I don't want to energize the breadboard until I've finished building the circuit. I will, however, connect the black to the negative just so the circuit board is grounded. Uh, you don't have to do that, but sometimes when you get into CMOS uh, work, it's a good idea to have everything grounded to the same reference point 
That way you don't accidentally uh, send electrical or static electrical signals through that could damage the CMOS. So you have the board set up here, uh, and the first thing you want to do is look at your circuit diagram and start out with the power pins. So you always want to make sure that your chip is powered because that's one of the easiest mistakes to make and you'll be saying, well, why is it not operating? Why can't I make this thing work? And it's because you might have forgotten to connect the power. So this is the negative or the ground and that should be connected to pin number one. Now, because the little notch is at the top here, that means pin number one is the one pin on the left side here. And you can connect it basically in any of these holes in that row. I'll connect it next to the chip. Now I'll show you that. You can connect it uh, really in any hole as so long as it's in the same row. It doesn't matter which hole, but it just has to be in that row because that's the one connected alongside the chip. So sometimes it's a little bit of a trick to actually get it in the holes, depending on how tight the breadboard is, uh, is made. But if you just get it in the hole like that, it should make a reasonably good contact. It has some sort of uh, kind of swipe connector that puts pressure on whatever pin is placed in it to keep it installed. So that was the negative. I'll connect the positive, which you can use a red to do, and that's going to be connected to this pin over here, which is, according to the diagram, the VCC pin, the input power pin. Now, the rest of the circuit, I'm gonna build kind of one piece at a time. It doesn't really matter what part you start with, but I'm gonna arbitrarily start with the output now. So you have a 4K approximately resistor. I'm using a 3.9. Really, that's gonna depend on the power rating of your LED and the current rating of your LED, as well as your input voltage. I'm using 12 volts in, and this ends up being a pretty good balance of a resistor for that, uh, this LED. So the way I'm gonna do that is I'm going to connect one side of the resistor to pin three, which is uh, the third pin here. I'll get closer to the camera so you can see. This is the third pin down from the top. And I'm going to connect it to basically some random point elsewhere on the board, so long as it's not interfering with a different component. Now, in order to make the, actually, for strategic purposes, I'm gonna actually connect it over here and I'll show you why in a second. If I do that, well then now I can just put the LED from this hole over to the ground. Of course, with any sort of component, generally the longer of the two pins is the positive. There, this LED is no exception. See how this pin has been bent and it's about the same length as this, meaning it's somewhat longer. So I'm going to put it into this same gutter or this same uh, bus bar or this same bar here that is connected to this resistor. And I'll show you up close that I'm connecting it to the same row as the resistor because these are all these holes are connected together. Now the other side I'm going to connect to my ground rail and now you'll see why these grounding bars, these uh, bus bars of sort are really helpful because it allows you to connect a bunch of things to the positive and negative uh, without having to jump or lead between the different wire connections. So now that I've connected this up, that's the power of the LED output going from pin three to ground on the diagram. I'm going to add this uh, small capacitor from number five to ground. I don't actually, uh, this is actually a 100 nanofarad capacitor because I just pulled it out of the bin, but it doesn't actually need to be 10 nanofarads for this particular application. All it wants is a small low value capacitor to ground just to keep this pin stabilized so it's not floating in the alternating current range. So I'm going to count one, two, three, four, five happens to be this one on the bottom here. And my hand is in the way, of course. Five happens to be this one on the bottom, this very last pin. So I'm going to connect one side of the capacitor to it and the other side to ground. Now, this is an unpolarized capacitor, so it doesn't matter which pin you connect. So now that we've connected that, I'm going to make sure that all the other pins need to, are where they need to be. Number four needs to be pulled high. So uh, just to denote that this isn't a power pin, I'm going to use a different color. I'll just arbitrarily use yellow. Pin number four is this pin here, which is next to the uh, resistor output, pin number three, and that needs to be pulled up to the positive. So I'll just connect it over here to the positive. Now, I need to make sure that all of my uh, remaining timing pins are connected. I've already connected four, eight, uh, three, five, and one. Now it's two, six, and seven, which are the timing pins. The first thing you'll notice is two and six are connected together. So I'm gonna to go to the pin number two, if you can see sort of on the board, pin number two is this one here, right next to pin number one. And I'm gonna grab that and I'm gonna jumper lead around to the other side of the chip. 
It's good practice to avoid running wires directly over the chip because you may actually need to install a new chip if you accidentally burn this one out or if it's defective. It also makes it a little easier to tell what you're doing later on in the circuit. So if you go to pin number six here, well, I'll route it around to the outside. Pin number six is that one there, and that's now connected to pin number two as per the diagram. Now, the great thing about these breadboards is you can actually connect more than one uh, device or more than one lead to an individual pin of the chip because there are several, uh, I think there's actually five, yeah, there's five holes on each side. So that means you can, re you can connect multiple uh, jumpers to the uh, pins. And as you can see, there are actually one, two, three, four things connected to pin number six in this diagram. Now we've already connected pin six to pin two. So next, what I wanna do is connect pin seven via the resistor to the uh, high rail, and then we can work on connecting the last two things to pin six. So I'm gonna go to pin seven, and I'm gonna get one of these one kilo ohm resistors. And on pin number seven, which is the second to last pin, I'm gonna put one, well, if I can get to it, I'm gonna put one side into pin seven, and I'm gonna put the other side into the ground pin, or the uh, positive pin, like so, if the breadboard will cooperate. Now it's hard to tell here, but if I get close to the camera and do an autofocus, you'll see that uh, this resistor is connected from pin number seven to the positive pin. Now the next thing you'll wanna do is connect uh, the other resistor from seven to six. So you can kind of get it cl uh, close, uh, get the pins of the resistor close together like this and put one of them into seven and the other into six. Now there, it is getting quite component dense here, so you'll wanna be careful that the leads are not shorted together at any point. But if you get uh, quite close, you'll be able to see what's connected to what in order to make sure that everything is uh, not, everything is touching where it's supposed to and it's not shorting out across. These are a bit close together for what I'd like to see. I prefer them to be further apart, but sometimes it just on the breadboard ends up like that. So now we've connected these two resistors up. Pin six has been connected to pin seven and pin seven has been connected to the high rail. The last thing we need to install is the 100 microfarad capacitor. Now this is an electrolytic capacitor and that means it is actually polarized. The shorter one with the minus on it has to go to the ground and the longer one without the minus has to go to the positively oriented or positively biased side of the chip. This can actually vary within the circuit because some circuits will actually have the ground at a higher reference potential than some other part of the circuit. You just have to make sure that the most negative part of the capacitor's uh, uh, connection is on the negative side. And in this case, the most negative at a part of the circuit will be the ground. So to do that, you're going to go from six to ground. So carefully, we'll, I'll find the sixth pin here and connect it to ground like that. So hopefully none of our pins here are crossed up. If they are, things will either uh, do nothing or the magic smoke will be released. We'll find out in a second. So if all goes well, when we ap apply power to the circuit, the light should start blinking roughly five times a second. We will see what happens now. And it looks like it works. That's exactly what we wanted to do. Uh, it looks like the uh, light is actually a bit too bright for the camera. It's kind of oversaturating it. However, it does work. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be exactly 4.8 hertz because these are carbon film resistors and they're not super close tolerance. But that being said, it's pretty reasonably close to five times a second. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. It's a little slower. Maybe the component values are not quite uh, what they say they are but it does blink on and off. And really, if you used higher quality resistors, you'd be able to make it more precisely match the 4.8 Hertz that we would expect. But you can see the duty cycle is pretty reasonable. It's on longer than it's off, and that's because it's, you're expecting a 67% duty cycle, and it is continuing endlessly. It's not changing its frequency or turning off. So hopefully this was a good demonstration of how to use the breadboard. The biggest advantage of the breadboard is, of course, having the paralleled holes that are connected together in the rows and the big bus bars on the sides. 
when I was younger, I didn't really know about this uh, breadboard configuration, and I would actually build everything on Vero boards, which are these little plastic cutout boards with holes drilled in them, and you had to solder everything, and it was really uh, quite tedious. So the discovery of a breadboard really allowed me to start uh, making circuits more quickly and uh, prototyping things more rapidly. The only thing I don't really like is, like I said, a lot of things get clustered when you start building things with components, and sometimes things short together. If I kind of stick my fingers in here, I can probably make it stop working. Probably, well, yep, there you go. It stopped working when I shorted a couple of things together. That's one of the other problems with the breadboard, of course, is it's not great for long-term use. Uh, if you left this circuit in here and someone came by and uh, tipped it over and then turned it back over, well, actually in this case it's still working, but it, had a, it would have a good chance that it would break. Uh, so if you really do want to build your circuit long term, you will want to think about soldering it together, but for simply prototyping it, the breadboard is a great way to start. You can pick these up online or at your local Radio Shack if you still know what that is, if uh, they're even in business by the time this video goes out. And if you set it all up, it should hopefully uh, show results similar to this. So hopefully this was an informative video. Uh, you can try other experiments with the 555. You can tweak the values to do, uh, use the A stable, or you can change the configuration so it's monostable, meaning that it only turns on once. That's useful for just a continuous pulse or a single pulse of uh, a set duration or you can even have it adjustable using something like a photodiode, which of course changes its resistance depending on the light striking it. That always makes for a cool project. So thanks for watching and good luck with your breadboarding.